All right, today we'll talk about the Enlightenment. It's a pretty incredible time where people really begin to experience free thought for the first time. And the result of this is really a drastic reimagining of society, uh, new ideas in philosophy, government, economics, reason, all sorts of really important uh, discoveries are made at this time. Uh, so first, what is the Enlightenment? And the Enlightenment really can be described as an intellectual movement that occurs all the way across Europe from the really the late 17th century through the 18th century. And that's when it hits its stride in the mid-1700s. the mid uh, And it's a frame of mind and a really a new radical way of approaching knowledge. And because of this, it drastically changes the way that people view and interact with the world. And all of this comes as a direct result of the scientific revolution. And we'll talk more about why that's the case uh, in a minute here, but this is centering in Europe, but of course spreads outwards from there, uh, but specifically beginning in France. And, and there are three key concepts in the Enlightenment that, that lead to these new discoveries and new way of thinking. The first is that the, these methods of natural science that are discovered during the scientific revolution could and should be applied to try to understand all aspects of life. And this is a concept that we call rationalism. Uh, rationalists also believe that this scientific method, which has risen out of the scientific revolution, uh, was capable of discovering not just the laws of nature, but also the laws of human society, as if experimenting would lead them to understanding uh, the way that people interacted and how people were. And lastly, and this really is a new uh, revolutionary idea, this idea that progress is possible, which would allow people to create better societies. You begin to see people in Europe getting out of this rut of thinking that this is the way things are always going to be and start to imagine a world where people are better to each other and the quality of life is better for everybody. So this idea of progress is brand new and really revolutionary. Uh, the Enlightenment begins in France for really three main reasons. The first is that pretty simply Fran French is the international language of the educated. Latin has pretty much gone by the wayside at this point, and French is what's being spoken at universities and in the scientific community. So that's what these enlightened thinkers are doing. Naturally, people born speaking French are more inclined to do it. After the death of Louis XIV, uh, there's some relaxing of the absolutism in France. This allows for the beginnings of free thought, uh, and that really enables this to, to grow and this community of uh, philosophers to exist. And lastly, the French philosophes, uh, which is what they're called, begin asking these fundamental questions about why. And not only are they asking these correct questions, but then they're trying to apply these correct quest or these questions to um, quote the public, which is a new concept. They're trying to get off down from their high and mighty tower and start figuring out how they can help people's lives. And that really is new. Before all this engagement would have happened at a university with no repercussions for their ordinary people, but now they're trying to think, how does this affect the public, the everyday person? So that's new. And a lot of this discussion happens in what are known as salons, which is the home of wealthy aristocrats. Mostly it's organizations run by women. It was a way for them to show off their wealth by throwing these lavish, they're not necessarily parties, but gatherings of intellectuals who can bat these ideas around. And as you'll see, all of these people that we're going to talk about live contemporaneously with each other. So these gatherings of the uh, intellectuals really produce these new ideas. We'll start first with John Locke. He's an English philosopher, uh, and he really subscribes to this new idea called the contract theory of government. And this basically says that the government derives its power from the people and they're in an implicit contract with the people in order to govern so he says people are sovereign that is they are free they have their own power uh, the only reason that they create a government is to meet their political needs now if this government fails to meet those needs then uh, it should be overthrown so this is this new concept of people have a right to be governed by a government that's actually working for them. And that's a radically new concept. Uh, before this, monarchs had, had answered to no one. They believed in this divine right, this idea that God gave them the power, and that's who they answered to. And John Locke's saying, no, you, you're responsible to the people, and if you are not meeting their needs, they have a right to overthrow you. But if you are meeting their needs, they should support you. 
John Locke's also famous for another idea called the tabula rasa, which is this idea of a blank slate, and he believes that humans are born as a blank slate, and that they learn through experience. That is, they don't have innate knowledge or anything of that sort, but by doing things, they are learning. So that's John Locke, English philosopher. Uh, the Baron de Montesquieu, he's a Frenchman. He has his portrait taken uh, in the way of the classic Greco-Roman style. Uh, he is an aristocrat, and despite that, he believes in the separation of powers. And the reason for that is, you can see when he's around, that's during the reign of Louis XIV, and then into Louis XV. But Montesquieu really believes that uh, the monarch has too much power, and the aristocrat should have more. So he pushes for the separation of power. He writes this book called The Spirit of the Laws, in which he argues for this separation of power, really removing the power from the monarchy and splitting it up. Now despite this, uh, he does not believe that everyone is equal. He really is anti-slave, anti-women, kind of anti-poor person. But he does believe that the monarch should share his power with the aristocracy. Uh, Voltaire is perhaps the preeminent philosoph at this time. Uh, he is the kind of the main name. Uh, and Voltaire supports the idea of absolute monarchy as the best form of government. He really truly believes that that is the best way uh, to govern. But he has this idea of an enlightened absolutism. And we'll talk more about that later, but it's kind of an idea that if you get the uh, monarch knowledgeable about life and humanity, that then these monarchs would create uh, beneficial laws for everybody. So. Although he pushes for absolutism, it's this idea of an absolutism, uh, enlightened absolutism. He also advocates for freedom of religion and expression, and he gets into a bit of a, a scuffle with the Catholic Church over that. He's pretty, pretty anti-religious, uh, especially anti-established church. Uh, he is what we would call a deist, where he believes in a higher power, but is anti-traditional church power. Uh, Denis Diderot is famous for creating the first encyclopedia, and... Uh, really just gathers information from a bunch of very intelligent people. What they themselves called the Republic of Letters. That is, learned people from all parts of Europe. From England, from Poland, from Denmark, from France, from Spain, from Italy. All these men and women are writing each other with their new ideas. And they declare themselves this Republic of Letters. Uh, kind of this Republic of the Books, Republic of the Intellectuals. And Diderot says, look, there's all these great ideas and all this intellectual achievement happening. Let me gather this in. And what really starts as a scientific uh, collection expands well beyond that to become the first encyclopedia. So that's what you should know Diderot for. And again, you see that all these men are contemporaries of each other. Next, we have Mary Wollstonecraft. And she's a very famous English Enlightenment thinker. And she was best known for pushing for women's rights. Uh, and she writes a, a very famous book called Vindication of the Rights of Women. In, in this, she argues that men and women really are equal. Uh, women just don't have the same opportunity as men. They don't have the same access to education. And because they don't have access to education, they are not able to achieve as high as men. But she argues if women were educated, they would be equal to men. And this is really a radical thought from her time. Um, it really sets the foundation for a women's rights movement. And that's a fight that's still being fought today. So Mary Wollstonecraft is certainly an influential lady and an influential thinker. And uh, deserves mention among all these Enlightenment thinkers. We're moving a little bit towards the later era of the Enlightenment in which people begin to move from rationalism to skepticism, and David Hume is one of those. Um, he's very skeptical that you can know really anything. It's almost a postmodern view. He says the human mind is nothing but impressions, and all of these impressions kind of blur into one, and anything we try to access is tinged by our memories and our impressions, and therefore we can't really trust it. Because of this, he says that reason can't tell us anything about questions that are not based on sense experience. That is, that reason can't tell us the meaning of life. Reason can't tell us about the creation of the universe. Reason can't tell us about 
astronomy because we're not interacting with those on sense experience. So Hume begins to be very skeptical of the idea that knowledge is even attainable. Uh, he really believes that anything we know, we know through our experiences and our senses, but that of course then is biased by who we are. Um, so kind of a, a skeptical view of the world. And then we have Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is really different from the rest of these Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, the rest of them believe that society could progress and get better in order to help humanity. And Rousseau believes that, in fact, civilization is destroying humanity instead of liberating it. And really, civilization is causing our downfall. And Rousseau, because of this, he believes that humanity and society can be saved in two ways based off two fundamental concepts. That is the idea of the general will and popular sovereignty. And the general will is what's best for all people. And he really specifies that that might be different from what all people want. And uh, it might be what only a few want, but it ends up being the best for everybody. And this goes hand in hand sometimes with this idea of popular sovereignty, which is when the collective whole makes a decision. Um, he argues that sometimes the general will, uh, only a few can see it because everyone else is being short-sighted. So although people might not think that they're being helped at the time, they really are in the long run. So Rousseau has a, a much more negative view of society. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this and have ever seen the TV show Lost, you'll notice a lot of these names were pulled from that show or I should say the show pulled a lot of their names from these Enlightenment thinkers, and the traits of those people really reflect uh, the Enlightenment thinkers. Just something to think about. So what are the consequences of this Enlightenment? There are three major ones, really, and the first is this massive change in government systems. Uh, you may have heard of the French Revolution, uh, kind of a bloody time period, a uh, result really of these ideas from these men, and Mary Wollstonecraft, so women as well. Uh, the American Revolution happens, of course, but there's also these shifts in the way that uh, kings and queens view their power and their right to rule. There are shifts in law. So you really have government changing from this unquestioned divine right absolutism towards an enlightened absolutism, towards this idea of social contract, towards this idea of even republic. Uh, there's change in science, culture, and the arts all taking influence from these intellectual movements and thoughts. Uh, and of course, a result of this, in, especially because of the skepticism, is a decrease in religious belief. And that is mostly just traditional religion, uh, belief in organized structure. A lot of these Enlightenment thinkers are deists, where they believe in a higher power. But in terms of believing in this organized structure, that greatly decreases because of the Enlightenment. It's a new way of thinking of the world that really shatters a previously held worldview. So between the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, we have this truly fundamental shift in European society in the 16 and 1700s. And this really changes into a more modern looking Europe.